All right. Well, good morning again. Thank you for all the visitors that are here. Thank you for spending your, uh, that you're not off traveling on the 4th of July weekend and you're here. Um, so, right back up. All right, so we're going to jump into it. Yes, yeah, kids, kids dismissed. Yeah, that's, that's usually, <laughs> I didn't think of doing that. Um, obviously, as we're coming up on Independence Day, I wanted to just take this Sunday to reflect upon was the Revolutionary War sinful? Was it a problem? Was it an issue? Uh, did the Founding Fathers break um, outside of the Scripture? In fact, you will even hear prominent pastors and prominent Bible theologians and Bible professors and stuff say that is, indeed they did. They, they were actually, they went against the Scripture. And we're going to read the Scripture. Um, if you have your Bibles, Romans 13 is where we're going to, to, to talk about today. Um, the um, Romans 13, 1 through 7. I see what you're saying, Rodney. Sometimes it jumbles up where the words go. Hopefully the next slides are going to be where we'll be able to read everything together. But if you have your Bibles, Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Uh, as you're turning there, I'm, I'm going to pray again. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together to, ga to gather for the purpose of studying your word. S studying your word to rightly divide and handle the word of truth. Father, I pray that you give me the words to say, lead and guide my, my mouth, guide my lips. May this message be glorifying to you, exalting to you, and edifying for us. Holy Spirit, have your way amongst us. Bring conviction to our hearts where we need convictions, but may everything we do exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Romans chapter 13. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Romans 13, starting in verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So these scriptures are obviously talking about the government, right? That all governments are instituted by God in God's sovereign will and sovereign plan. If it's a good king or good leaders, that's God's plan. If it's bad king or bad leaders, that's God's plan. Everything happening is God's plan. And that's usually how these verses are taken. And generally, I'm going to point out, there are, again, prominent pastors, including John MacArthur. Anybody ever hear, hear of him? I like a lot of things that John says. John years ago, I don't, th I don't know that he will hold the same approach anymore. But John years ago taught and said, our founding fathers, it, they basically broke God's word in order to uh, do the Revolutionary War. Uh, the blessings and everything that we have received from God, God just basically kind of like turned from breaking of God's word and still blessed their efforts. I disagree with John on this. I think John would disagree with himself on this now because he lived through COVID. His authorities told him to shut us down his church. And if he didn't, he was, threatened, he was threatened jail time. He was threatened astronomical fines. All these different things were done to him. Did he shut down his church? No, he did not. So how come he didn't submit to his governing authorities? I think John's position changed on this because what is happening here is we cannot take this scripture and let it stand alone. If, that's called proof texting, where we take something out of context and we do not use other scripture to try and interpret. What is, the, what is the fullness of what God is trying to convey? What is the fullness of what God is trying to teach us? Now, this is very evident that God is talking about, and the scripture here is saying that God, he puts leaders into place. And there are countless scriptures, countless scriptures saying that exact thing, that God will put certain kings and certain people into place, sometimes in order to bring judgment. Does he not? 
He brings these, puts these people in for the sole purpose of bringing judgment on his people because they forsook his covenant, they broke his law, they transgressed his righteousness, therefore there is going to be consequences in judgment. And Israel's history is full of that. Full of it. But you also conversely have something else going on. God is not for tyranny. He does not stand for tyranny. Because every tyrannical leader always murders people. You've probably heard it said that the largest, largest cause of death in, in the world today you know, has all been over religion. Has anybody heard that? Religion has been the biggest cause of death. Well, when you actually count the stats up, you actually find it's <coughs> communism that has actually killed more people. Just look at, just look at, look at the 1900s and every communist dictator, tyrannical leader. They killed people by the millions, upon the millions, upon the millions. Multiple uh, Russian presidents did that. Hitler did that. Right? Just continue on down the line. Right? So many. You, we, can, we can just fill in a list, all centered around this complete idea of tyrannical control. If you oppose what they say, if you oppose what they do, you're dead. Right? Countless millions have been lost actually due, due to political ideology, much more so than religious. So this is what I want to come to. I want to ask, was the American Revolutionary War actually sinful? Next slide, please. I wanted to do a quick recap of our history, uh, kind of give an idea of where, of where we're at. So let's kind of put this in perspective. Obviously, we know the Declaration of Independence, uh, July 4, 1776. But let's look a few years prior to this. The King James uh, Bible was commissioned by King James, okay? King James I. As you can see, when King James lived, but he commissioned the Bible in 1604 to be done. It was eventually published in 1611. There's a lot of people that have this stance, King James only. That's the only authorized version. There is no other version that is, is worth reading. All the rest of them are inferior. Well, those that say that are not reading the original 1611 King James Bible. They're reading updated versions. There's been about four or five King James updates and translations and different things done, okay? So there is other good Bible versions, okay? It's not like it's another version. Let me just explain. I think everybody knows this here, but when there is a Bible version, it's kind of a poor word. It's more like a translation is what we should say, right? Being translated from the Hebrew and the Greek into English. Some people love King James. That's fine. Love King James. But a lot of people that have King James won't read their Bible because it's difficult to read. That's a problem, we need to be reading our Bibles. So that's the purpose of these other translations. Any translation that you read that allows you to understand what you're reading, read that. There's a few that I would steer you, steer you away from and guide you away from because they're pretty bad. They, they do actually make some pretty significant changes to the text, and I would definitely steer you away from that. But there's a, there are many good translations that allow us to read the Bible easily, to comprehend, right? That's the whole purpose of it. The book is meant to read, not to sit on a shelf or be a cup holder. Amen? Okay, so King James does this. Now, this is what's important. This is what King James does. He, he does something prior to this King Henry VIII, prior to King James I. King Henry VIII, he wanted to annul his first marriage. Catholicism was the, church, the, the main church in England, as it was in, in most of the Western world. And King Henry VIII sought the Pope uh, to say, hey, I wanted to be divorced from my first wife. He just didn't like her anymore, so he wanted to get rid of her. King Henry VIII was married multiple times, I think like seven or eight times, Okay. But the Pope said, no, that's not how marriages be looked at. You can't just annul a marriage once it's, once, it's, once it's began. You've made a covenant union. You can't just do that. So King Henry VIII said, I don't know what I'll do. I'll make my own religion. And that's exactly what he did. He kicked out Catholicism, and he created what's known today as the Church of England. He put himself as the head of it. So each king continued on as the head of the Church of England. Does anybody see any problems with this? Does this sound like there's a complete interaction between church and state? Are you following the king controlled the religion, and people had no choice in how they were to worship God. They were to worship however the king commanded they worship. Anybody see a problem with that? Potential problem? Okay, so as we get to King James, we get to this point. As the head of the Church of England, he ordered church leaders teach two new doctrines to support his positions. Boy, that would be so convenient, wouldn't it? Just be the head of it, head of it all. I'm going to have my preacher start preaching new things. And by the way, you couldn't continue as a priest in the Church of England unless you abided by these two principles. 
Principle number one, the divine right of kings. What is this? This means that kings stood in place of God, representing God to the people. Who stands as, as the representative of God to the people? It's Jesus Christ, right? So clearly we are removing ourselves from the text. Before the King James Version was published, right, to, to, the Geneva Bible was in place before this. King James hated the Geneva Bible because you know what started happening? People were reading the Geneva Bible and they were recognizing, wait a minute, the king is not doing as God says a king ought to do. And as the, as the Geneva Bible was being reprinted, right, as the printing press was around and books were getting out more and more and more, uh, the, the margins were large. And so there were commentators and preachers that would point out specifically how the king is breaking this verse or breaking this, these things. So you can imagine a king would be pretty upset about this. Like, wait a minute, this is going to affect my rule. So you know what I need to do? I need, I need, to, I need to establish, and by the way, this is similar to Catholicism. Right? This isn't a brand new concept, right? The Pope stands as a representative of God to the people. So he takes that idea from this. But number two, notice this one, complete submission and non-resistance to authority. That because kings held an allegedly divine position, they were not to be resisted for any reason ever. <laughs> then you got a group of people called the Puritans. The Puritans in England actually got their name as a derogatory name. When they would say Puritans, they gave them this name, mocking them. Oh, those are the guys that just want the pure Bible. <laughs> Puritans. They would spit as they said their name. I don't know about you, but that's really what I want is just the pure Bible. <laughs> so I guess I would be classified and spit on upon as well. So these Puritans, what we come to be known as the pilgrims, they are actually fleeing England because of the religious persecution that they are facing. And by the way, for the king to establish his religion and keep himself where he is fully in charge and fully intact, yeah, he's killing a lot of people. And he's brutally attacking them. He's brutally um, persecuting them. Okay, N next slide, please. So the Puritans, they end up going uh, to the Netherlands, trying to seek some refuge there. But they're not able to really get the refuge that they're, that they're seeking. So they, they decide, you know, we're going to go back to England and we're going to eventually make our way to the New World. Now, obviously going on in the 1600s here, Jamestown was established in 1607. Plymouth Rock is significant as it was established in 1620. Jamestown was the first English colony that was planted in Virginia and the purpose of it was purely for economic benefit. That was the goal of it. Now, I want to make a contrast here between Plymouth Rock and Jamestown. 13 years apart, the, the spirit behind these two Initial plants and colonies, one in Massachusetts, one in Virginia, are significantly different. And I'm going to make the argument that actually the spirit of our nation as America is rooted at Plymouth Rock, not the Jamestown. And I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to prove that here in, in, in just a moment. Jamestown, again, it was an economic engine. That was the purpose of it. It failed miserably a couple times, but they kept investing in it and trying to get it running and get it going. Jamestown had lots of issues, lots of problems. And um, something, a contrast I want to make between Plymouth Rock and Jamestown. Jamestown had a, sh a slave ship come to it with about 20-something slaves on it. That's still unacceptable. But the way that history in schools tries to project it is that everything was established on the back of slaves, and that's how it was done. I, when I went to Jamestown on a tour, I was blown away. There was, a, there was a, a, a black park ranger that gave us the tour through there, and he said there... There was always free, free blacks in Virginia, even back at Jamestown, business owners and everything. I said, I'm sorry, sir. And I talked to him afterwards. Can you repeat that again to me? I have never, ever heard that ever in school. Everything I've ever heard about this was there was never any free blacks. It was always a, a slave position, second class tier, everything. He said, no, that's not how it was. Whoa. Whoa. Right? Like, wake up suddenly now. Like, what, am I, what have I been taught? What have I been, been told about everything? Okay, let me contrast Plymouth Rock. When a slave ship came up to, to Plymouth Rock, in, uh, in this colony, slavery was seen as the evil that it was, and it was not to be tolerated, accepted. And, and anybody that is participating in slave trade, they are to be arrested and thrown in jail, and they get to stay there. So a slave ship shows up in Plymouth Rock, and they didn't even allow it to, to port. Uh, or they, they didn't even allow it to dock. They actually went out to it. They freed all the slaves on it, and they arrested all the crew and put them in jail and tried them on illegal charges. 
big difference, right, in these two colonies. How come we don't talk about Plymouth Rock much in school? Well, there's a reason for it, because of the Mayflower Compact. When, when Bradford wrote the Mayflower Compact, it's completely and totally centered around Christ. Everything about it is centered around Jesus and that they recognize as they are fleeing religious persecution, they are coming to a city on a hill in order that God was doing something special and they recognize it. They understood it. Next slide, please. Plymouth Rock began to seed this nation spiritually. What was actually going to be the foundation, the thinking, the, the understanding of how this nation would work. Uh, up there in Plymouth, you have the National Monument to the, fo to the Forefathers. I never heard about this monument until we did the biblical citizenship course here. If you weren't here for that, man, you really missed out. This monument is the largest granite monument. If you would, next slide, please. Um, I don't know if you're all able to, re to read that. It's thought to be the largest solid granite monument in the United States. It's 81 feet tall. And it was built to honor the passengers of the Mayflower. Why? Because a monument which features allegorical figures depicting the virtues of faith. There's morality, education, law, and liberty on the bottom part. There's four, like, monuments down below. And then there's this great big central figure right in the middle. And that central figure on the main pedestal stands the heroic figure of faith. See that there? There's faith. Her, her right hand is pointing to heaven and her left hand clutches the Bible. And they made this monument, and it took years upon years to make it, because we kind of had some problems called uh, internal uh, national problems, uh, kind of hindered the completion of this called the Civil War. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, if I recall correctly, actually finalized in the funds to finish this thing. They started, this took a long time to complete. I never heard about this ever in school that this existed. And it's our largest granite monument in our nation. For what purpose? It's the monument to our forefathers. Notice how our, this country did not see Jamestown as our forefathers. They saw Plymouth Rock as our forefathers because Plymouth Rock was coming. They were the ones seeding this nation with the, the thinking, the thought process, the morality of which we were going to guide ourselves because there is only, beloved, listen to me, there's only one worldview in this world that gives people the freedom to choose how they will worship what they will do. You know what it is? It's, the, it's Christianity. And that's why this nation is under such great attack. You will hear people constantly say, this isn't a Christian nation. This isn't a Christian nation. I'm sorry. If you read tons of our founding fathers, if you read uh, Supreme Court justices, all these people from early, they over and over call this nation a Christian nation. Why? Not because it's a Christian nation because it coerces people or forces people to worship Jesus. Quite the opposite that they recognize it's the principles of Christianity that allows you to choose whom you will worship and how you will live your life. No other worldview allows that. Um, two slides over, please, please, Rodney. Okay, so now we come to um, the biblical position. There's a couple biblical positions as we're approaching the Revolutionary War. Remember, we have King James. He's, he, is, he is not only commissioning for a new Bible to be, to be written, but he's also trying to do this to establish his reign and rule, that he is the vicar of God. I stand in place of God, and because I do, I have absolute authority over you and everything about you. Keep in mind, right prior to this, kind of going on at the same time, you also have the Reformation happening. If you're not familiar with the Reformation, this idea of spiritual liberty is breaking out through a lot of Europe. You have Zwingli. Anybody ever heard of him? He's not one that's, that's, that's remembered too much in the Reformation. Extremely prominent figure in the Reformation. He was before Martin <coughs> Luther. Anybody ever heard of him? Okay, how about John Calvin? Anybody heard of him? Okay. Zwingli came before. He predated these other two. All of this stuff is stirring. You understand? It's, bringing, it's literally bringing humanity out of the Dark Ages. One of the reasons why it's called the Dark Ages is because the Catholic Church ruled everything. They were the ones who appointed the kings. You know why they did that? that they can maintain control. Church and state were so interconnected completely that there was no separating them. We take for granted our First Amendment, that there's a separation of church and state. By the way, that statement is not in the First Amendment, but I'm going to get to that. We take for granted this concept, but for most of humanity's history, it didn't exist. And if we don't wake up to what's happening in our nation we won't have it much longer either. 
So we will hear countless people use Romans 13 talking about it and saying, look, we are to submit to every single whoever it is that is put there regardless because God has appointed them there. And they hide behind this theological concept of God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty means that God controls everything. He is over it all. I fully believe that. God is sovereign over it all. That does not necessarily mean God exercises his sovereignty in every circumstance. Do you understand that? What I mean by that is the evil that happens in this world is not God's sovereignty making that happen. James writes that God is the tempter of no one with evil. God doesn't tempt anyone to do anything evil. So if we stay locked behind God's absolute sovereign control of all things as though everything is predestined, it is what it is. It's going to be what it's going to be. We just kind of meander through it with our eyes closed. And I don't know. I don't even need, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to share Christ with anybody. I don't need to do anything. I, don't, I can ignore Jesus' commission, go into the world and make disciples because, you know, they're already, already, they're already chosen. The reality is, God's sovereignty in the doctrine of predestination, that those who are saved are going to be saved, the Bible talks about that, absolutely. The Bible also talks about this ability of man's responsibility, that they have to respond. They have to, they, they, why would Paul over and over talk about, when it comes to the gospel, that you have to die to yourself? Your flesh nature has to be crucified. You have to learn to live and walk by the Spirit. There is a responsibility that man has to, to, to respond to God. And where those lines interse intersect, I would use the word called paradoxal. It's outside of our understanding. God knows where those lines intersect, but both are clearly established and firmly established in Scripture. Firmly established. Anybody that is going, hold on a second there, Shane. You just slow your roll. Who gave Adam the ability to choose sin in the garden? We have a problem here, don't we? So is God tempting, tempting people to sin? No. So man does have this some action. Does the Bible talk about how God can move the king's hearts like a river any way that he wants? Absolutely he can. Just because God has absolute sovereignty doesn't mean that he is exercising at all times. When we see great evil happen in the land, why would God keep asking Israel to shuv, Hebrew word shuv, return to me, if they didn't have the ability to reject? Does that make sense? Over and over in his, Israel's history, this is God's very own people. He's not forcing them to follow him because we have, we, we have a responsibility in this. So you have the Reformation taking place where people are starting to get the Bible in their own hands. Now, the... Not a lot of people could read, okay? So that's something, by the way, a public education system that we have in America, it's a good thing. There's some problems with it today. But educating our people is a good thing. You know where that principle comes from? The Bible. I'm telling you, like so many things that we do as a nation, it comes from scriptures. The founding fathers understood this, and they went to this. They knew if they stepped into the Revolutionary War, God would never bless what they were doing if they were breaking his word. God would never help them sin. Does that make sense? God would never help them sin better. So they, had, they spent hours and tons of time working over the scriptures. I don't even have time to go through all of the prominent preachers that were seeding the seeds of liberty in America before the Revolutionary War began. And we're going to get to this, but you know that America never fired the first shot. In like five or six specific battles, we never fired the first shot because we never saw ourselves as being the aggressor. God would not bless that. But we do have a right to self-defense. And we're going to get to some of this stuff. But one of the biblical positions that we held, remember, as we're coming to the Re Revolutionary War, Reformation's taking place. You got, the, uh, you got the king in England saying, I want to do whatever I want to do, so I'm going to get rid of, I'm going to get rid of this, uh, this church, create my own church, guise it in Christian language, but I'm going to be the head of it. King James uses this spiritual authority to be able to say, you know what, anybody who speaks against my authority, you know, you, you, done, done away with you. To even be a, a, a priest in the Church of England, you had, to, you had to oath yourself to these two ideas, these two doctrines to teach us. That's called brainwashing, right? You're brainwashing people to not think for themselves and use critical thinking. You have some issues now going on over in the colonies. 
Did you know the colonies three times tried to abolish slavery? Hear me. The colonies tried to abolish slavery three times. Benjamin Franklin writes about this. And you know, you know why it didn't pass here? Because the king vetoed it. The Christian king, you hearing me? The Christian king vetoed and said, no, no, it's way too profitable. I need to keep that. Okay. So what do you do when your government, right, that's over you, is guising their evil actions in Christian language? You just supposed to sit back and take it? No. So what the, let me get to this. What the founding fathers understood and what they wrestled over, and by the way, has anybody ever heard of John Locke? Okay, so this isn't central just happening in America. This is happening in England, too. John Locke was a heavy, influential, um, he was a philosopher, a, uh, a, uh, a politicist. I mean, he, he wrote a treatise on government. He wrote two of them. The first one, uh, he actually quotes the Bible over 1,400 times. The second treatise, he quotes the Bible nearly 300 times. He, he was talking about the way the Bible was supposed to affect the way government works. And that if it doesn't affect the way government works, you immediately get into tyranny and, and, and a despotism, a tyrant. The founding fathers were working over these scriptures, and they understood something. It's the institution of government that God has ordained, not every individual government. That government is God's idea to bring justice to those that have been wronged. It's God's plan to have a government that operates on righteousness and truth and justice. I have told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to what? Do good. Love, love kindness and walk humbly with your God. <laughs> Scriptures are filled with all sorts of different things. If, if, if Paul meant in Romans 13, 1 through 7, that all governments are put in place by God and you cannot go against them, that means every reformer was in sin. Every one of them was in sin. Let's go back even further. That means Moses was in sin. How dare he stand against the Pharaoh? That means the Hebrew midwives that disobeyed Pharaoh's command and slaughtering all the male babies and then keeping Moses aside... They were all in sin. That means Rahab. You know Rahab. She shows up in Jesus' line, right? She shows up in Hebrews 11, uh, uh, getting all sorts of praise for the faith that she had. She lied to her government officials and hiding the spies of Israel. She must be in sin. Right? We can just go right on down the list, but yet these people were commended for their faith. How about we get to the New Testament? What about, what about the apostles? What about when Peter and John are standing? In fact, let's turn there real quick. Let's go over to Acts. And I just, I want us to see this. Acts chapter 5. I don't want you guys to think that I'm making this stuff up. <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> That's right. Acts chapter 5, um, verse 29. I'm going to back up to verse 27. The apostles are arrested and freed. They're brought before the high priest. Remember, the, this is where the high priest, the, the religious group, also commanded the laws for Israel as well, right? The legal system. Rome was ultimately over them, but Rome actually allowed Israel to function with their own stuff, their own religion, their own laws. Just They had to just keep allegiance with Rome. So uh, the apostles are brought before the high priests and all the council, verse 27, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name, the name of Jesus. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than whom? Men. What a bunch of sinners. Don't they know they're just supposed to submit to whoever's there? God never wants you to align with evil. Do you understand that? Never. Does he align you to evil or does he align you to sinful things? When your government starts to project sinful behaviors and forces you to do this, you understand there is a move within our nation that is trying to prevent you from thinking certain thoughts. You're not allowed to say that. 
You can't say that. I don't know if any of y'all pay attention, but some of these Supreme Court cases that just were ruled on this past week, anybody pay attention to those? We have some major wins. And one of those major wins is the First Amendment free speech. A Christian web designer says she didn't want to make a, 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 a wedding website for, for a gay couple, and they sued her. We've heard, these, we've heard these cases before, right? The case, this is what's significant. With the baker, it was over religious conviction and religious freedom. With the website designer, this was different. This was about free speech, that you cannot force somebody to say something they don't agree with. That is significant. We, I, I, you guys might just be looking at it and going, like, yeah, that's no big deal. That makes sense. Then you're not paying attention in culture. You're not paying attention in society what's happening. The, society has been trying to stop you from saying certain things because it might be offensive or it might hurt. Like, for example, you have to call somebody different than what they biologically are. And if you don't, you're a horrible person. You're not allowed to think differently than whatever reality somebody else wants to put on. You can't speak truth. We would say it's, it's objective truth, right? It doesn't need me to affirm it to be true. But it's preventing us even from speaking our personal truth, right? What's happening in society is that it's, it's forcing people to say, you must think and behave this way. Otherwise, the government will come after you. They will do everything they can to stop you. And this case was decided 6-3. All the constitutionalists... Here I said that, not conservatives. All the constitutionalists said this is unacceptable. You cannot force people to say things they do not agree with. All of the liberal lefties said this is wrong and they voted in favor for it. There is a hard political line that unfortunately has been separated around the Constitution, but both sides will try to use Constitution as their talking point, right? They're betting on us being ignorant to what it actually says. And the reality is a lot of us are ignorant to what it actually says. An originalist constitutionalist is someone who looks at the Constitution in the original language, in the original time, to understand what they meant. I've heard in school throughout my life, the Constitution is a living document. Kind of like the Bible, it's a living document. What they mean by that is I can reinterpret authorial intent. I can redefine what the original people who wrote it meant. I can, just, I can have it say and mean whatever I want it to mean. The problem is, is we've got what's called the Federalist Papers. It's basically commentary on the Constitution that tells us exactly what these men were thinking and feeling because they penned it. And they told us what they mean and what they felt. So now we get to separation of church and state. How many of us have heard that in our lives? Separation of church and state has to be separated, cannot be together. You go try to find that in any of our founding documents, it will not be found. Because the line isn't there. That line actually comes from a letter, personal correspondence letter, written between Tom, uh, Thomas Jefferson and the Danbury Baptist uh, Association in Connecticut. And the Danbury Baptist Association in Connecticut was really concerned with what's, well, what was going on in our nation as the Constitution is being uh, implemented and it's being designed and everything's kind of starting and get rolling. They're like, hey, what does this exactly mean? Because if you're not aware of American history, Baptists were actually extremely attacked. They were extremely persecuted. The original portion of the Constitution said there would not be a, a distinction between denomination, not religion. Because denominations were attacking other denominations. Okay? Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter back to the Danbury Baptist separation and said, your pastor told you right. It is a one wall of separation between church and state. Notice how some of those words get kind of removed. And we just separation of church and state. They're taking a line. L listen, <laughs> people do this all the time with the Bible. They take a line, not even the full line, just a few words out of it, out of context of the overall letter and, and, and authorial intent of what the author is trying to convey, and they use it to say whatever they want it to mean. They redefine the meaning of the text. They've done this with Thomas Jefferson's letter. Why in federal court is a personal letter between Thomas Jefferson, who wasn't even in the country when the Constitution was written? He was serving as an ambassador to France at the time the Constitution was written. Why is a personal letter from him used in federal court cases to determine what the First Amendment means? It's because of strategy. And this is how effective Satan is. 
And those of you that have been coming consistently, I've been working through the Gospel of Matthew, where we've seen the deception of the enemy and what he will do even inside the churches. You know how often I hear the church repeat, oh, separation church and state can't be involved. They're repeating the same lie over and over and over again. Okay. For a little more history, for those that hate history, I'm so sorry. But if we don't learn from our history, we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes. When Thomas, um, James Madison is the author of, of the Constitution. When he was writing the Constitution, he actually was running for a seat that would have represented Mecklenburg County. But there was also a prominent preacher running for that same seat at the same time. Wait a minute. Separation of church and state? Why is a preacher running for a political office? Because you can't think of it in today's term. They understood, I'm not going to go into government to force people to be Christians or force them to come to this denomination or force them to do that. I'm bringing with it the, the agreed moral principles and practice that we have as a nation. When we go to the court of law, when we have been wronged, we're asking the judge to, you know, we're appealing to the judge for justice, right? Does that make sense? You're appealing for retribution. Make this situation, whatever the situation, correct. I've been wronged. Make it right, judge. To do that, you are appealing to something, to some form of morality. Why do you feel wrong? Why do you feel something wrongly has been done to you? Well, they shouldn't have stolen from me. Why do you say theft is wrong? Does that make sense? You're appealing to a moral order, a moral principle. And this nation's laws were founded upon the morality of the scriptures, the principles of what this teaches. Okay, so come back to James Madison. Uh, he's running for a seat in Virginia. Prominent, uh, prominent uh, Baptist preacher is dominating him in the polls. Last name is Leland, if you're interested to look at him. Leland is not willing to give up uh, the race. Madison needed to get, to get the, the seat in order to pass and ratify the Constitution. Leland said, listen, I'm not going to give up the seat. I'm not going to give up the race unless you rewrite that First Amendment and make it stronger to protect religious freedom and liberty in this nation. Madison said, I think it's strong enough. Leland said, I disagree. <laughs> I'm not leaving the race. Yeah. I will veto this thing up, upside down and left. Madison readdresses the First Amendment and makes it what it is today. Leland agrees, pulls out of the race. Madison wins the race and is one of, and one of the needed votes to ratify the Constitution. Okay? All that happened right here in Virginia. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> Pretty cool being in Mecklenburg County to get in and talk about this. Okay. So you, move, you fast forward on this stuff. Um, uh, Rodney, would you go up to that slide? When we came to the Revolutionary War, and I'll go through this quickly, guys. I, I apologize. I get talking about this stuff, and I ramble on and on. So thank you for hanging in there with me. But back to biblical principle number one. When they came to discussing the Revolutionary War, most of America had read upon two. You had some like the Quakers who said, no, 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 no. Whoever God has put there, no matter how bad it is, that's, that's God's man, and we just have to deal with it. The Quakers thought that way. Most of America did not think that way. There were a few others. But biblical position number one, Christians are forbidden to overthrow the institution of government and live in anarchy. But they were not required to blindly submit to every human law and policy. Do you understand how they're interpreting Romans 13, 1 through 7? They recognize God has ordained the institution of government, but when it forces us to submit to evil and tyranny, that's not God's plan. That's not God, what God has ordained. Biblical position number two says God would not bless an offensive war. Any war initiated to coerce others or to take their land, rights, or property, however, God would bless the efforts of self-defense against any such offensive war. They knew an evil government is not to be accepted, especially when it's done in the guise of a Christian king. And they also recognized an offensive attack. God would not bless that. But he would bless self-defense. Ne next slide, please. The American, American Revolutionary War was not an offensive war undertaken by Americans, but rather an act of self-defense against British military attacks and remained a point of frequent spiritual appeal for the founders. Look here. 
America, as I mentioned earlier, did not fire the first shot, not in the Boston Massacre of 1770, the bombing of Boston and burning of Charleston, 74, or in the attacks on Williamsburg, Concord, and Lexington in 75. You ever hear that line, do not fire unless fired? Because they firmly understood God would not bless the efforts they were doing if they took the offensive. And it was England that fired the first shot many times. They said, all right, now it's time, now it's time to, to wage war. Now it's time to stand. If you've ever looked at American history, what it took, the amount of providential care of God to allow us victory is undeniable. If France didn't come and help us and show up at one of the final real battles, we would have lost. George Washington, after one battle, he got off his horse. He had like two or three horses shot out from underneath him, and he kept in battle, kept going. Man, this man, when he got off and he looked at his coat, he took off his coat, there was like six or seven bullet holes that went all the way through his coat, and he wasn't injured. That's when he realized there must be God behind this. Beloved, when we come to this point to celebrate Independence Day, there is truly something worth celebrating in this nation. The origins of this nation is so firmly rooted in the things of God that take us all the way back to the Plymouth Colony, that goes all the way back to the Reformers, that goes all the way back to people saying, we need to give people liberty, because liberty is not man's idea, it's God's idea. Amen? If you notice, government tries to take liberty away. Anybody notice that? Okay, <laughs> making sure everyone's with me. But God is giving liberty. He gives freedom. And he does this through whom? Jesus Christ. We were wrapped up in our bondage, in our chains, in our sin, in our addictions, and all of our stuff. But God says, I don't want you stuck in bondage, stuck in that tyranny of sin under the devil. I don't want you in all of these things. I will do something on your behalf that you didn't even ask me to do for you. I will pay the penalty for your sin on the cross and forgive you of your sins if you just repent. If you just bring it and give it to me, just hand it over to me, and I will give you true independence, enabling you to actually become the man and woman you never thought you could be. This nation is birthed upon those ideas. Next slide, please. I want to read through just the top portion and then the bottom few lines of the Declaration of Independence. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal uh, station in which, uh, to which the laws of nature and of nature's gods entitles them. A, notice how what Je Jefferson is appealing to. Notice, he's not appealing to Christianity, is he? He's appealing to nature and nature's God. He's saying it is written in... We don't have time to go through this, but Jefferson was so influenced, so many of these lines are directly taken from preacher sermons, by the way. We go, man, what Jefferson, what a master writer here, and just so eloquent in what he said. He didn't, he didn't originate these thoughts. These thoughts were originated from the scriptures as taught by the preachers, and John Locke talks a lot about this as well. But these immutable principles that are put into the Declaration of Independence come from the Bible. And you will not find another Declaration of Independence. We don't even have time to go through the Constitution anywhere like ours, anywhere in the world or ever in history. And it is founded upon this Judeo-Christian worldview. Not, again, not coercing or forcing people to become Christian or live Christian lives. But the moment you take God out of the picture someone is going to fill that void and they're going to be the authority and the control. But God says, you know what? You can choose. Choose this day whom you will serve. Notice the way God does it. Choose. But I'm going to create the ability for you to choose. Okay? A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Next slide. Ah, oh, shucks. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their, here again, their creator with certain unalienable rights. 
that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to, to secure these rights, notice where he's saying these rights come from. This is a total contrast to the king, is it not? The king says, I'm the one who gives you your rights and abilities to live. I'm the one who grants you life. I'm the one who gives you liberty. I'm the one that allows you to pursue happiness. And the forefathers say, no, you're not. Your throne must bow to the king of kings and the lords of lords. You do not have rule over us. The only reason why, James, you sit on that throne is because God has allowed you to be there, but you have defected from your responsibility. You are to punish evil and protect those doing good, and you have forsaken that. One by means, selling innocent human people. And you refuse. We have tried to cancel this three times and you vetoed us every time. You, king, are no more. Now it has come to us that we realize we have got to set out and create a new nation that will not allow this atrocity to ever exist again. And I don't, man, I wish I could continue down history uh, and how Jefferson did this. Jefferson, he's always criticized. Well, Jefferson had slaves. The dude wasn't perfect. Are any of you perfect? I remind my wife all the time how perfect I am. Right? But the rest of y'all are still working on it. Okay? But the reality is, Jefferson, when he became governor, do you know that he was the first governor? His first act as governor was try to abolish slavery in Virginia. Did you know that when he became president, his first act as president, well, one of his acts as president was to ban the importation of all new slaves? Jefferson had conflict within him and what he was doing. And I, I'd love to dialogue with you with that if you're interested, but we're going over on time, so I'll just kind of keep moving through. It's, it's, it's fascinating when you study these men out. Okay, but he recognizes our creator grants us these rights that no government is allowed to take away, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Romans 13, what we just read. Deriving their just powers from the consent of the who? Of the governed. That's why our Constitution starts off as what? We, the people, have declared these things, right? This is totally new. Do you understand? They're coming out of a society where the king is over it all. Human history is coming out of this thinking where the, where, where the, the state and the church are controlled by one and the same body that are bickering back and forth of who's going to have the greater power and greater influence over people. People are being awakened to what Scripture actually says and what God has destined humanity to be. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, but not to move to anarchy, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness." Next slide. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be charged, I'm sorry, should not be changed for light and transient causes. You don't just go in and out of governments because it doesn't feel right, right? It has to be spe real specific issues that are transgressing God's righteousness and how he ordained government. Just like God ordained the family, so he has ordained government. Amen. And when it goes outside the boundaries of what God has declared it is to be, that's when the, the consent of the governed stands up and say, enough's enough. You have defected from your responsibility, O oh leader, O oh king, whoever it is, because you have to submit to the, the king of kings. There is a Lord that's over you. Whether you recognize him or not, we the people recognize. And that's how, that's how, th this is the mindset behind these guys. And accordingly, all experience has, sh has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, that's tyranny, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Next slide. Uh, such has been the patient severance of these colonies. And such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. Notice what they're saying. They're not saying that, hey, we want to do this because we're upset. Notice what word he's using. We're constrained to do this. 
We are constrained by duty for all of humanity to do what we're about to do. Because there was a greater conviction over them than, what, than the threat of the king. They realized there was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And that is what constrained them to do it because they recognized the way humans were being treated was unacceptable. And I'm going to hit this point again, including slavery. They tried to get rid of it multiple times. I want to show you something in just one second. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let the facts be submitted to a candid world. And then they list out all the issues that they're having with the king. I did not put all of those. I would encourage you. I don't know when the last time you ever read this document. It's very, very short. Look at the usurpations of the king, the problems that they have, and you're going to see multiple parallels exactly to today. Exactly today. But then it, we get to the, to the end. He, King George III, is who he's referring to, has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of distant people. This line used to be, this was in the rough draft of the Declaration of Independence. Just think about this. This was in the rough draft. The only reason why it's not in there, uh, wasn't in the final product is because South Carolina and Georgia wanted to keep slavery. So in order to keep this aspect of us moving together as a nation, they, they, uh, they dropped this part out. But it wasn't over. If you pay attention to Lincoln's words, Lincoln actually appeals back to the Declaration of Independence and recognizing that these forefathers understood something. It wasn't if slavery would be abolished, it was when, and they set all the groundwork to make it happen. And Jefferson and the forefathers purposely left thing in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, that all are given these inalienable in order to lay the groundwork for abolishment of slavery eventually. But this was in the rough draft. This is what's behind these forefathers, penned in Jefferson's own hand. I'm sorry, he didn't write it, the final, like, that beautiful copy that we have. A, a, guy, a guy with great penmanship did that. But this is what Jefferson originally, a uh, uh, rough draft, wrote. King George has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of distant people who never offended him captivating and carrying them into slavery into another hemisphere uh, uh, um, uh, or to incur miserable death in their transpiration thither. This pira piratical warfare, he's literally calling the king a pirate. This pirate, uh, this disgraceful, this disgrace of infidel powers is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain. Determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold, he has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or to restrain their excrepable commerce. That's pretty direct, don't you think? Did you ever hear this in school? It's kept away for a reason. Next slide, please. Was that it? Okay, I did another version. I had some more stuff in there. You guys are probably like, oh, thank God he didn't send that one over. <laughs> okay. What I'm trying to get to, beloved, is what the apostle said. We are to worship God, not men. We are to submit to God and not men. As we celebrate this Declaration um, uh, Day, this, in, this Declaration of Independence Day, this is a, signif a significant thing. Our culture is trying to erode America. Are there some stains in America's past? It's a big yes. But if you notice, none of these lefties will ever compare America to another, uh, to another nation. They only compare America to America. And that's actually part of their playbook. Because if you compare America to any other nation, America will look like a shining jewel. The reason why America has been able to right some of these wrongs, and there's still work to do, but the reason why they're able to right some of these wrongs is because of our founding documents of what these men understood. We're not forcing a theocracy where people have to submit. They're forced to submit to the God of the Bible. But they laid it in all the principles and framework. It's what they appealed to in order to bring humanity around the central cause that these things are good and we will punish evil. So that, and if you notice, it's actually, it's mainly Christians that actually pushed many of these good social causes. It's I'm telling there's a reason why history is not encouraged anymore, and it's sad when history in school is made really boring because it's, it's really fun. 
but our Bible's full of history, and it shows us the condition of man's heart, and it shows us God's heart towards humanity. And God's heart towards humanity is to free us from all of our sin, our bondage, our anxiety, our depression, our chains, all of it. He wants to free us from these things. And anybody can receive the work that Jesus has done for them on the cross if they repent and, re and, and receive Jesus' finishing work. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. God, I thank you for the patience of everybody in here. I thought it would be pretty quick, God. It just, it's so rich and so deep. You have instituted, uh, you have ordained the institution of government, but not every government has led in the way that they ought to lead, in the way that you have designed it. You have instituted an ordained marriage. You've instituted an ordained family. You've instituted an ordained government. And we can go on down the list. All of these things are under attack of which the government did not create. They created none of these institutions. You created them, Lord God. And we as a people, as a nation, have repeated the same lie of separation of search and state, not understanding what the First Amendment actually is, that it protects the free exercise thereof, and that Congress shall not make any law infringing upon that. God, we thank you for these cases that have made it to the Supreme Court that are, are pushing back to what the Constitution originally meant, what was the intent behind it, because that actually gives people liberty to live their lives. They're not forced to submit to anybody else's ideology. God, give us a clarity as a church, as a body, to be able to recognize the spiritual warfare that is going on, the deception, the deceit, the manipulation. These are tactics that are tried and true. They've been tried over and over, and they, and they work, and they're very effective, unless unless the people recognize these people serve at our consent, not at their own. Father, but it takes us to know your word and to know your clarity. Father, increase within every believer here a desire, a passion, a zeal for the truth, the purity of, their, of your word, and let them be satisfied with nothing less. Father, I pray for anybody here that may not have ever given their lives to you. I pray that they listen to your spirit. If today is the day of their salvation, may they turn to you today. May they get right with you today. May they repent of their sins, recognizing you are who you said that you are, that you died on a cross for their sins in order that you can give them forgiveness from the wrath of God. That if they turn and give their lives to you, they will be saved. Father, I pray if, if you are working on anybody's heart like that this morning, I pray that you give them the courage to come talk with me, that we can talk about that and what that looks like or what that is. Holy Spirit, may you have your way in our lives. May we serve you and your kingdom with a, with a, with a passion for truth and holiness. For now is the time for worships, worshipers to worship God in spirit and in truth. We pray this all in Jesus' covenant name. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much. For